we start on a new chapter that is control and regulation involving the nervous system and the endocrine system. We start off today's video with the nervous system. According to the syllabus, we first need to know the organization of the nervous system in humans. So this is the human nervous system which is divided into two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system is made up of two organs, that is the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system are branches of nerves that come out of the brain and the spinal cord. So the branches that come out of the brain are called the cranial nerves, while the Nerves that branch out from the spinal cord are called the spinal nerve. The nervous system are made up of nerve cells called neurons. The central nervous system is mainly made up of the interneuron, while the peripheral nervous systems contain both sensory neurons and motor neurons. Sensory neurons are also known as the afferent neurons, while the motor neurons are known as the efferent neurons. Structure-wise, these neurons look quite different. The interneuron is small and branched. The branches are called dendrites, while the sensory neurons and the motor neurons are much longer. The sensory neuron has dendrites that are connected to receptor organs or sensory organs like the eye and this end known as the axon terminal will be in very close contact with the interneuron. Likewise, the motor neuron also has ends here called dendrites that are closely connected to the interneuron and on this end, that is the axon terminal, it will be connected to effector organs such as the glands and muscle. So how this works is that the eyes will see something that is a stimulus and an impulse will be generated by the sensory neuron and then the sensory neuron will transmit that impulse along the nerve across the interneuron into the motor neuron. And the motor neuron will transmit the impulse to the effector organ, such as a muscle, for a response to occur. The process of how an impulse is generated or propagated and how the impulse is transmitted will be covered in future videos. For now, let's look at the detailed structure of a neuron. Although these nerve cells look different, they have the same parts, starting with the cell body. The cell body is where you find the nucleus, the cytoplasm, the mitochondria, and the ribosome. Then the rest of the neuron are divided into either dendrites, dendrons, or Exxon. To differentiate them, we just have to look at the structure. Dendrites are the smallest branches of the neurons. Dendrons are the part of the neuron that will transmit impulse to the cell body. And exon are the part of the neuron that will transmit impulse from the cell body out of the neuron. Important to note that the sensory neuron has dendron and axon that is almost the same length. Likewise, the interneurons also have dendrons and axons that are almost the same length. Only the motor neuron has a very short dendron and a very long axon. Now, at the ending of the axons, we have what is known as the axon terminal. The axon terminal has circles at its tips known as the synaptic knob, which I will explain in detail when we study on synapse. Neurons also have another type of cell attached 
to them that is known as the Schwann cell. These Schwann cells secrete a lipid substance which forms the myelin sheet. Now there are parts of the axon or the dendron where there is no Schwann cell. So that space between the two Schwann cells are known as the node of Randier. We have actually learned about the structure of the neuron in semester one. So if you need, you can refer to your semester one notes. We move on. Okay, where we now know how to describe the organization of the nervous system. We continue next with the formation of resting potential. This is something new. So you have to pay a little extra attention. To understand resting potential, we need to first understand the meaning of potential. Potential is actually measuring change in electrical values that occur when an impulse is being transmitted along the membrane of either a muscle cell or a nerve cell. Now we have seen the electrical measurements when an impulse is transmitted along the cardiac muscle cells, that is when we studied the electrocardiogram. Remember, the electrocardiogram will show us a pattern known as the PQRST wave. Okay, the P is when the sinoatrial node emits an impulse. Then the QRS is when the atrioventricular node emits an impulse. And then the T is when the impulse from the Purkinje fibers is returned back. So we have indirectly studied potential that is in relation to the muscle cell. Here we are going to study the potential in a nerve cell. It too has a pattern but the pattern is quite different from the PQRST wave. So let's now have a look at that pattern. In this diagram, you can see that the motor neuron is transmitting an impulse. So if we measure the change in the electrical value along the axon, this is the graph that we will get you can see this pattern is clearly different from the PQRST wave. So let me go into detail about the pattern of the nerve potential. Firstly, we need to know the axis of the graph. The y-axis is the membrane potential in millivolts, whereas the x-axis is time in milliseconds. Now, there are three values of the membrane potential that we must remember. Firstly, negative 70 millivolts. Secondly, negative 55 millivolts. And the third one is positive 40 millivolts. Now, these values are not confirmed values because sometimes they, in questions, negative 70 may be written as negative 80 negative 55 may be written as negative 45 or sometimes positive 40 may be written as positive 50. So the values are around this range. Okay, why these values are important is because they actually are measurements of specific potentials in the nerve. The negative 70 is the resting potential that is the electrical charge in a nerve that is not transmitting an impulse. Negative 55 is the threshold potential. This is the electrical charge in a nerve that is getting ready to transmit an impulse. And positive 40, that is the action potential, is the electrical measurement of a nerve that is transmitting an impulse. So now, if we take example when you are asleep. Most of your nerves will not be transmitting an impulse. So if I were to measure the electrical value of the axon at this time, 
I will find it at resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. But if the nerve is transmitting an impulse and I measure the electrical change in the axon when the impulse is being transmitted, then I find the graph will actually increase up to the action potential. Let me explain the graph further. We look at the graph once more. This part of the graph where it is showing a value of negative 70 millivolts is when the nerve is not transmitting an impulse. It is at rest. So because it is in a negative value, we consider the nerve to be polarized. Now when an impulse is received, the nerve will start to change its potential that is from negative 70, it will start to become less negative up to negative 55. At this stage, the nerve is getting ready to transmit an impulse, but it will only transmit an impulse if the potential can become smaller than negative 55. For example, it becomes say negative 50. At that time then, what happens is the nerve will start to become positively charged. So that process is called depolarization. It will reach a maximum of positive 40, that is action potential. So at that stage, your nerve will transmit an impulse. After the nerve has done its job, the nerve must return to being negative again. To do that, it will carry out repolarization. But what happens is it becomes more negative than it should be. For example, it may go down to negative 90. That is called undershoot. However, the nerve will return to normal once again to its resting potential and become polarized to receive a new impulse. So these are the terms that are used in describing nerve potentials. But to understand how a nerve can suddenly become negative, suddenly become positive, we need to understand the structure of the axon. So I'll use this diagram to show you the structure of the axon. Axon is just like any other membrane. It is made up of a phospholipid bilayer, which is embedded with some proteins. The first protein is the sodium potassium pump. The second group are what we call as the ion gated channels. You have the sodium ion gated channel with the gate that is outwards and the potassium ion gated channel where the gate is downwards. Then we have the non-gated channels that is the sodium ion channel and the potassium ion channel. These channels will enable facilitated diffusion occur down concentration gradient. These two channels also do facilitated diffusion but it is dependent on whether the gates open or not. While the sodium potassium pump carries out active transport. Besides knowing the types of proteins in the axon membrane, you also need to know what types of ions are present outside the axon and inside the axon. Outside the axon, like in this diagram, these black areas are the tissue fluid. And inside the axon, the areas that are bluish are known as the exoplasm. So we find both the tissue fluid and the exoplasm will have a distribution of sodium ions, which I represent as red squares, and potassium ions, which I represent as blue circles. However, 
only the exoplasm will have organic anions that are negatively charged. I will now explain how a neuron that is at rest, that means it is not transmitting an impulse, will have a resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. It depends on the sodium-potassium pump. The sodium-potassium pump carries out active transport. What it will do is it will transport three sodium ions from the exoplasm to the tissue fluid and two potassium ions from the tissue fluid into the exoplasm. Now you can notice that this transport is not balanced because there are three sodium ions leaving the exon and only two potassium ions entering the exon. So from here, you can see the tissue fluid is going to be more positive than the axon. However, we also have the sodium ion and potassium ion channels. These channels carry out facilitated diffusion. So the sodium ions that have accumulated in the tissue fluid will diffuse down the concentration gradient back to the exoplasm via the sodium ion channel. Just like that, the potassium ions that have accumulated in the exon will also diffuse out from the exon to the tissue fluid using the potassium ion channel. Now, in my animation, I have only shown you one sodium diffusing in while three potassium diffuse out. This is actually to show you that the potassium ion channels are more efficient in transporting potassium ions out of the axon compared to sodium ion channels which transport fewer sodium ions into the exon. So because of that, you can see there is going to be a huge accumulation of positively charged ions outside the exon. Meanwhile, inside the exon, there is going to be less positively charged ions as well as organic and ions. So this is what causes the exon to be negative 70 millivolts on the inside and outside the exon will be positive. So when we measure the potential of a nerve that is not transmitting an impulse, we will get a value of negative 70 millivolts. Let me summarize this in an easier way. Using the same diagram, we know that the sodium potassium pump will carry out active transport of three sodium ions out of the exon and two potassium ions into the exon. So the accumulation of the sodium ions is going to make the outside of the axon positively charged. Secondly, we see the facilitated diffusion by the non-gated channels cause less sodium ions to diffuse back into the axon, but more potassium ions to diffuse out of the axon. So these potassium ions once again increase the positive charges outside the axon. We look at the third factor. The third factor are the organic anions. These organic anions are negatively charged and they are too large 
to diffuse out of the axon membrane. So that is why you see inside the axon, it is going to remain negative. Outside will be positive. This negative value is the value that is measured at negative 70 millivolts. So to make a simpler drawing, we find outside the axon is going to be positive due to the accumulation of both sodium ions and potassium ions due to the role of the sodium potassium pump as well as the potassium ion channel. Inside the axon is going to be negatively charged because there is less potassium ions, less sodium ions, and a lot of organic and ions that are negatively charged. So when we measure this value inside the axon, that is the resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. So with that, we have concluded the explanation for formation of a resting potential. Now I understand this is completely new, so you may be a bit burnt out. So I let you recharge your brain first. Until I see you in my next video on action potentials. Goodbye. Bye.